Tonight, a critical test in the race for the White House. Five Republicans battling to become their party's 2024 presidential nominee. The candidates ready to make their case on why they're prepared to be commander-in-chief amid two wars on the world stage. How they plan to tackle stubborn inflation and how they can unite a deeply divided electorate. Who is best to take on President Biden? And can any of them first beat former President Trump, who's far ahead in the polls? The candidates are here. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley, entrepreneur Vivek Ramaswamy, former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, and South Carolina Senator Tim Scott. From NBC News, the Republican presidential debate. Live from the Adrian Arst Center in Miami, Florida. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Republican presidential debate. I'm Lester Holt, anchor of NBC Nightly News. Good evening. I'm Kristen Welker, moderator of NBC's Meet the Press. Hello, I'm Hugh Hewitt, host of Salem Radio's The Hugh Hewitt Show. We are now just 68 days from the Iowa caucuses when Republican primary voters will begin to determine their party's nominee for president. Tonight, we'll question five candidates seeking that nomination on how they're best prepared to be commander in chief. And of course, how best to bring down prices impacting Americans across the country. We have two hours for a serious debate on the issues that matter most to Republican voters. Candidates will have one minute and 30 seconds for answers and the opportunity for a closing statement. Follow-ups will be at the discretion of all of us at the table, the moderators. Invoking a candidate's name or policy does not necessarily mean the mentioned candidate is entitled to a response. We want to caution all the candidates not to interrupt or speak over your fellow debaters. If you talk over each other, the voters can't hear you. And given the critical issues we're facing specifically on the world stage, we want everyone to hear every word you have to say. Continued interruptions may result in loss of additional questions. And to our audience, please, please hold your applause so that the candidates can be heard. With that said, let's have a good debate. All right, our first question, the opening question, is one for all of you. Donald Trump is the first ex-president in more than 100 years to run for the White House again. And he remains popular among Republican primary voters as his legal challenges mount. Governor DeSantis, let me begin with you on this one. Speak to Republican voters who are supporting Donald Trump. Why should you and not him be the Republican nominee to face Joe Biden a year from now? This country is in trouble. And the elites that have put us here, they don't care about you. They don't care that you're having to grapple with higher grocery prices or have higher gas prices. They don't care that your family's less secure because of the open border that's allowed drugs and even terrorists to come into this country. Well, I care. I am not going to sit idly by and let this country continue its downward spiral. We need leadership, and we need it now. I'll take the hits. I'll take the arrows. I'll take the slings. Because ultimately, it's not about me. It's about you. I will fight for you. I will make sure to lead this country's revival, and I will win for you and your family. Actions speak louder than words. We don't have time for excuses, and it's not something that we're going to be able to have all these distractions. As a veteran, I will get the job done. Now, if you look where we are now, it's a lot different than we were in 2016. And Donald Trump's a lot different guy than he was in 2016. He owes it to you to be on this stage and explain why he should get another chance. He should explain why he didn't have Mexico pay for the border wall. He should explain why he racked up so much debt. He should explain why he didn't drain the swamp. And he said Republicans were going to get tired of winning. Well, we saw last night, I'm sick of Republicans losing. In Florida, I showed how it's done. One year ago here, we won. We want a historic victory, including a massive landslide right here in Miami-Dade County. That's how we have to do it. So I promise you this, as the nominee, next November I'll Thank get the Governor. job done, and as president, I will your, deliver your time for is you. Up. Let me turn to Ambassador Haley. Audience. Let me turn to Ambassador Haley. Why you and not the former president? 
Well, I think you look at the fact that we're almost $34 trillion in debt. 60% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. 50% of American families can't afford diapers. One in six American families can't pay their utility bills. You have parents who are worried about what's being said or taught to their child in the classroom. There's no transparency. We have anti-Semitism all over our college campuses, and students feel unsafe. You've got an open border where terrorists can come through, and we've got wars happening all over us, and there are dangers around us. You know, everybody wants to talk about President Trump. Well, I can talk about President Trump. I can tell you that I think he was the right president at the right time. I don't think he's the right president now. I think that he put us $8 trillion in debt, and our kids are never going to forgive us for that. I think the fact that he used to be right on Ukraine and, and foreign issues, now he's getting weak in the knees and trying to be friendly again. I think that we've got to go back to the fact that we can't live in the past. We can't live in other headlines. We've got to start focusing on what's going to make America strong and proud. And that's what I'm focused on doing. Let's make sure we pay down our debt. I think we need an accountant in the White House. Let's make sure that we have transparency in the classroom. As a mom, I know what that means. Let's make sure we secure our borders so that our families are safe. Let's get crime down because our families want to know that they can be safe no matter where they go. And as as the wife of a combat veteran, I will tell you, a military needs to know we have our back, and we need to make sure that America is Ambassador, strong. thank you very much. And, uh, let, me just, uh, let me just caution the audience. Let's not go down this road. We've asked you to please, you know, keep restraining yourselves, and it would be helpful so we can hear the candidates, because these are important issues, and the voters want and need to hear them. Uh, Mr. Ramaswamy, let me turn to you. Uh, please make your case. Why would you... Uh, why should you be the nominee and not the former president? I think there's something deeper going on in the Republican Party here. And I am upset about what happened last night. We've become a party of losers at the end of the day. We're a cancer in the Republican establishment. Let's speak the truth. I mean, since Ronna McDaniel took over as chairwoman of the RNC in 2017, we have lost 2018, 2020, 2022, no red wave that never came. We got trounced last night in 2023. And I think that we have to have accountability in our party. For that matter, Ron, if you want to come on stage tonight, you want to look the GOP voters in the eye and tell them you resign, I will turn over my, yield my time to you. And frankly, look, the people there are cheering for losing in the Republican Party. Think about who's moderating this debate. This should be Tucker Carlson, Joe Rogan, and Elon Musk. We'd have 10 times the viewership asking questions that GOP primary voters actually care about and bringing more people into our party. You think the Democrats, I and mean, we've got Kristen Welker here, you think the Democrats would actually hire Greg Gutfeld to host a Democratic debate? They wouldn't do it. And so the fact of the matter is, I mean, Kristen, I'm going to use this time because this is actually about you and the media and the corrupt media establishment. Ask you the Trump-Russia collusion hoax that you pushed on this network for years. Was that real or was that Hillary Clinton made up disinformation? Answer the question. Go. Mr. Ross. This is how we get our country back. We need accountability because this media rigged the 2016 election. They rigged the 2020 election with the Hunter Biden laptop story. Mr. Ramaswamy, and they're going to rig this election. Your time is up. Accountability. Let me turn to That's Governor, Governor Christie. Country. Why you? Audience, audience, let's not do this. Let's, let's not do this. Let's let the candidate speak. Uh, Governor Christie, why you and not former President Trump? Well, Lester, look, you said it at the beginning of the debate. We are dealing with extraordinarily important issues facing this country right now. We have our greatest ally in the Middle East under fire from a terrorist group that has committed to wiping them and every Jewish person in this world off the map. We have Ukraine with Vladimir Putin, a communist KGB dictator who wants to put the old band back together. He's starting in Ukraine, and he's going to move to the Baltics and Poland after that. We have inflation in this country that is choking, choking every American family that wants to try to rise up and give their children a better life. And tonight, we need to decide which president is going to be the one to tackle the big issues, who's going to make this country look once again, not just inward, but look outward at the world and say America is the country, the indispensable nation that makes this a safer world 
And in a safer world, American innovation, American hard work has always been the thing that has driven our country to greater things. I'm going to be the president who will do those big things. We're not going to be small, and I'll say this about Donald Trump. Anybody who's going to be spending the next year and a half of their life focusing on keeping themselves out of jail and courtrooms cannot lead this party or this country, right, and Governor. it needs to be said plainly. Governor, thank you. Let me turn to Senator Scott. Senator Scott, you've said former President Trump can't win. Make your case to Republican voters. Well, certainly. None of what I would say without any question is that the truth of my life destroys the lies of the radical left. We need a president and a candidate who will actually help our base solidify and attract independent voters into our party. The Great Opportunity Party is now winning back African-American voters and Hispanic voters because we are working on a foundation based on faith. Our nation is facing some deep challenges. It is the loss of faith in this nation that is a part of the erosion that we're seeing every single day. It's restoring faith, restoring our Christian values that will help this nation once again become the city on the hill. When Ronald Reagan talked about the city on the hill, he was coming from Matthew 5. When President Lincoln talked about a house divided, that was Mark. Our founding documents speak to the importance of a faith foundation. You don't have to be a Christian for America to work for you, but America does not work without a faith-filled Judeo-Christian foundation. I would be the president that helps us restore faith in God, faith in each other, and faith in our future. Without that focus, none of the issues, the policies matter. We have to get back to being a nation that is, in fact, the city on the hill that believes in each other enough for us to fight Scott, for that future. You. Senator Scott, thank you. We're going to turn now to the challenges facing <clears throat> the next commander in chief. You'll all be fielding questions first from me and the Republican Jewish coalition and then from Kristen and Hugh. So as we continue forward, uh, the Israel Hamas war is barely a month old. Tonight, Israeli troops are fighting inside Gaza City with over 200 hostages who remain captive there, and civilian casualties mount inside Gaza. As President of the United States, what would you be urging Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to do at this moment? Governor DeSantis. I would be telling Bibi, finish the job once and for all with these butchers, Hamas. They're terrorists. They're massacring innocent people. They would wipe every Jew off the globe if they could. He cannot live with that threat right by his country, that Hamas should release every hostage and they should unconditionally surrender. I'm sick of hearing the media, I'm sick of hearing other people blame Israel just for defending itself. We will stand with Israel in word and in deed, in public and in private. And I can tell you, as governor, I actually did something about it. Biden's neglect has been atrocious. Uh, we had Floridians that were over there after the attack. He left them stranded. They couldn't get flights out. So I scrambled resources in Florida. I sent planes over to Israel, and I brought back over 700 people to safety. There could have been more hostages had we not acted. And I'll tell you this, I met the first plane load uh, when they came to Florida, and one of the mothers pointed to a six-year-old daughter, and she said, my daughter had been saying the last two nights, Mommy, I don't want to hear any more bombs, no more rockets. I just want to get back to Florida. So there's a difference between words and deeds. We acted, and we saved lives. Thank you. Ambassador Haley, what would you do? What would you be urging Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to do? Would you consider humanitarian pause, for example? The first thing I said to him when it happened was I said, finish them finish them. And the reason is, I worked on this every day when I was at the United Nations. And we have to remember that they have to, one, eliminate Hamas, two, support Israel with whatever they need, whenever they need it, and three, make sure we bring our hostages home. We need to be very clear-eyed to know there would be no Hamas without Iran. There would be no Hezbollah without Iran. There would not be the Houthis without Iran. And there wouldn't be the Iranian militias in Syria and Iraq that are trying to hear, hit our military men and women if it hadn't been for Iran. And who is funding Iran right now? China is buying oil from Iran. Russia is getting drones and missiles from Iran. And there is an unholy alliance. We need to be clear-eyed. The last thing we need to do is to tell Israel 
Israel what to do. The only thing we should be doing is supporting them and eliminating Hamas. It is not that Israel needs America. America needs Israel. They are the tip of the spear when it comes to this Islamic terrorism, and we need to make sure that we have their backs in that process. All right. Thank you. Mr. Ramaswamy. Mr. Ramaswamy, any daylight between you and the candidates we just heard in this issue on, on what you would tell the Prime Minister? Not in terms of what I would tell the Prime Minister, no. In fact, I would go one step further. The founding vision of Israel was based on the idea that they don't want to depend on anybody else's sympathy or direction in defending themselves. So what I would tell Bibi is that Israel has the right and the responsibility to defend itself. I would tell him to smoke those terrorists on his southern border, and then I'll tell him as President of the United States, I'll be smoking the terrorists on our southern border. That's his responsibility. This is our responsibility. That's how we move forward. But I want to be careful to avoid making the mistakes from the neocon establishment of the past. Corrupt politicians in both parties spent trillions, killed millions, made billions for themselves in places like Iraq and Afghanistan, fighting wars that sent Thousands of our sons and daughters, people my age, to die in wars that did not advance anyone's interests, adding $7 trillion to our national debt. And Joe Biden sold off our foreign policy. Joe Biden's son, Hunter Biden, got a $5 million bribe from Ukraine. That's why we're sending $200 billion back to that same country. The fact of the matter is the Republican Party is not that much better. You have the likes of Nikki Haley, who stepped down from her time at the UN. Bankrupt or in debt is, was her family. Then she becomes a military contractor. She joins the board of Boeing and otherwise, and is now a multimillionaire. So I think that that's wrong when Republicans do it or Democrats do it. That's the choice we face. Do you want a leader from a different generation who's going to put this country first, or do you want Dick Cheney in three-inch heels? All right, Mr. In which case, we've got two of them on stage Mr. tonight. Swami, thank you. Senator, uh, Senator Scott, yes. Senator, same question to you about you're the president, you're on the phone in the Oval Office with the prime minister, you tell him what? Well, number one, I would tell Prime Minister, Prime Minister Netanyahu, not only do you have the responsibility and the right to wipe Hamas off of the map, we will support you, we will be there with you, we'll stand shoulder to shoulder, there will be no daylight. But I would change the station a little bit, though, and head back home to, to America. I would say to President Biden, diplomacy only is a weak strategy appeasement leads to war. From President Obama to President Biden, Obama sent millions to Iran. Frankly, President Biden has sent billions to Iran. That is why I've said that there is blood dripping from the hands of President Obama and President Biden. I would tell President Biden with great clarity, if you want to stop the 40 plus attacks on military personnel in the Middle East, you have to strike in Iran. If you want to make a difference, you cannot just continue to have strikes in Syria on warehouses. You actually have to cut off the head of the snake, and the head of the snake is Iran and not simply their proxies. In order for us to have a powerful response from America, we have to be in a position of strength. As President of the United States, my foreign policy is simple. You cannot negotiate with evil. You have to destroy it. All right, Senator Scott, thank you. <laughs> Governor Christie, I want to get you to weigh in here. Look, Lester, these problems are so big and serious that the first thing I would say to, to Prime Minister Netanyahu is pretty simple. America is here, no matter what it is you need at any time, to preserve the state of Israel. Remember that Hamas's main goal is to get rid of Israel is to get Israel absolutely off the map. Now, there are three things I think I would say to him when he asked for advice. The first I would say is that it is absolutely your obligation to protect the territorial integrity of Israel. Secondly, to make sure you protect the security and the safety of your people. Every time something happens to compromise either one of those things, it creates greater unrest in the entire region. Second, you must go in and make sure that Hamas can never do this again. Uh, the fact is that Israel and their intelligence community failed. They failed here and they failed the people of the state of Israel. And so we need to work closely and better together to make sure, one, that they're degraded, and two, that we know everything that's going on inside the Gaza Strip, when it's going on, so that something like this can't happen to kill 1,400 individuals again. And the third thing is to keep your eye on the ball. Make sure 
that we continue to isolate Iran, work with the reasonable nations in the Middle East, the other Arab nations who want to partner with you, and make sure that we continue to isolate Iran so that their only friends in the world are the part of the evil foursome, China, Russia, Governor, Iran, and North Governor Korea. Governor Christie, thank you very much. And we're going to continue in this vein right now with a question from Matthew Brooks, the CEO of the Republican Jewish Coalition, a partner of the Republican National Committee in this debate. Here it is. Given attacks by Iranian-backed proxy groups on U.S. military bases in Syria and Iraq, attacks that have wounded approximately two dozen of our U.S. servicemen, do you support the use of military force by the United States against Iran? Governor Haley, would you please answer that? Yes, I'd first like to say they're five-inch heels, and I don't wear them unless you can run in them. Um, <laughs> The second thing that I will say is I wear heels. They're not for a fashion statement. They're for ammunition. What we need to be doing for Iraq and Syria is, first of all, the idea that our men and women could be targeted and that we've allowed almost 100 hits to happen under Biden's watch is unthinkable. We need to understand this is Iran giving the green light, telling them what to do, and we shouldn't be doing the tit for tat like what Joe Biden has done. We need to go and take out their infrastructure that they are using to make those strikes with so they can never do it again. Iran responds to strength. You punch them one and you punch them hard and they will back off. But what we don't need is Biden falling all over himself to get back in the Iran deal, him giving $6 billion to get five hostages home, him telling Netanyahu now that he needs a pause or a ceasefire. We don't need him going and sitting there tiptoeing around Iran because he thinks they're going to do something. You don't respond to an enemy and a terrorist with fear. You respond with strength. When you do that, that's when the world pays attention, and that's when Iran stops. Thank you. Governor DeSantis, if I can continue with you. Uh, just today, the U.S. launched another one of its limited airstrikes uh, against targets in Syria, this time Iranian-linked uh, facility. How far would you go militarily to hold Iran accountable? Well, first, Matt, thanks for your question, and I appreciate what you've done over the last month. I know it's been very difficult for the community, and appreciate you guys rallying together in difficult times. Uh, I actually served in Iraq back in the day, and um, we had al-Qaeda in Iraq. You had Shia militias that were funded by Iran that were killing hundreds and hundreds of U.S. troops. And as commander-in-chief, I am not going to put our troops in harm's way unless you're willing to defend them with everything you have. Biden has them out there. They're sitting ducks. He's doing glancing blows. That's just inviting more attacks from the Iranians. I would say you, you harm a hair on the head of an American service member, and you are going to have hell to pay. We are not just going to sit there and let our service members be sitting ducks, and that's true whether it's the RAN or whether it's any country on the world. We have to be strong, and we have to defend the people who defend us. All right, thank you, Governor. Now our second and final question from Matthew Brooks of the Republican Jewish Coalition. Please watch. Jewish students across the country are threatened and under attack. What do you say to Jewish students on college campuses who feel unsafe given the dramatic rise in anti-Semitism? And what do you say to university presidents and college presidents who have not met the moral clarity moment to forcefully condemn Hamas terrorism? Mr. Ramaswamy, would you like to take that one? Absolutely. I think the scourge of anti-Semitism across this country, including at places like my alma maters and places like Brooklyn Bridge in New York, it's sad to see, but here's what history teaches us. Anti-Semitism is a symptom of a deeper cancer in a country, in a society that is lost, and we are lost. Several years ago when I wrote my first book, Woke Inc., I was talking about they were chanting death to America. Death to white people, death to Christians. Nobody was waking up back then. Now it's even bad. Now they're saying death to Israel and worse. So it is wrong, but we have to get to the root cause here. Now, I think it's really important that we do this through leadership, not censorship. Leadership means fill that void with purpose and meaning. Dilute this wokeism and anti-Semitism to irrelevance. These kids, they have no idea what the heck they're even talking about when they're siding with Hamas over Israel. They are fools. But I also want to caution here, if we go the direction of Ron DeSantis or Nikki Haley, with whom I respectfully disagree on this issue, 
pro-censorship, telling student groups to disband. Mark my words. Soon they will say if you question a vaccine and its side effects, you're a bioterrorist. Soon they will say that if you show up at a school board meeting, you're a domestic terrorist. Soon if they say that J6 prisoners should be released, you're an insurrectionist terrorist. So that's where this road ends. We don't quash this with censorship because that creates a worse underbelly. We quell it through leadership by calling it out. These university administrators have lost their way, and we need leadership at the top in the United States of America that restores our founding values and that has no place for this kind of anti-Semitic hate. That's where I stand while respecting our Constitution. Your time is out. Uh, Senator Scott, uh, let me get you to weigh in on what you just heard. Well, let me just say to every single university president in America, federal funding is a privilege, not a right. Number one. Number two, to every student who've come to our country on a visa to a college campus, your visa is a privilege, not a right. Number three, any campus that allows for anti-Semitism and hate to allow students to encourage terrorism, mass murder, mass murder and genocide, you should lose your federal funding today, period. To all the students, on visas who are encouraging Jewish genocide, I would deport you from those campuses. We have to stand strong with our Jewish Americans. At the end of the day, we should not have our Jewish students in a library being told to hide on our streets in New York. A Jewish citizen has the right to walk on the streets of America with no fear. They have the right to go to college campuses, go to class, and not fear. We will restore that. I started working on anti-Semitism on college campuses in 2017 because even then there was a rise of anti-Semitism on college campuses. We must force the people off those campuses and Senator frankly... Scott. Thank you. Let me, turn, Out of our country. let me turn to the Governor DeSantis here. What do you think about what he just said? I was the first presidential candidate to say, if you are here on a student visa as a foreign national, you're making common cause with Hamas, I'm canceling your visa and I'm sending you home. No questions asked. Second, I have friends here in Florida who their kids do not feel safe even going to university campus at all outside of the state of Florida. You have Jewish students fleeing for their lives at Cooper Union. Joe Biden should have the Department of Justice on these college campuses and holding the universities accountable for civil rights violations. When you have, you should not have money going to these places. I already acted in Florida. We had a group, Students for Justice of Palestine. They said they are common cause with Hamas. They said, we're not just in solidarity, this is what we are. We deactivated them. We're not gonna use Tate tax dollars to fund jihad, no way. And what is Biden doing? Not only is he not helping the Jewish students who are being persecuted, he is launching an initiative to combat so-called Islamophobia. No, it's the anti-Semitism that's spiraling out of control. Right. That is what we have to confront. And as president, I can tell you this, we are not going to stand for this on college campuses any longer. All right, Governor, thank you. Let me turn to Governor, Governor Christie. And, and considering what he just said, you led a state with a sizable Muslim population. Last month, as you know, a six-year-old uh, Palestinian-American boy was killed in Illinois by his landlord. His mother was also stabbed more than a dozen times in what has been charged as a hate crime. What do you say to Muslim Americans who are also feeling afraid for their safety right now? Lester, I'm the only one on the stage who's actually had experience in dealing with this. I was appointed by President Bush to be the U.S. Attorney in New Jersey on September 10th, 2001. And when I took over that job after the September 11th attacks, I had to deal with a situation in our state that was explosive. We're the most ethnically diverse state in this country. And so first, we heard credible reports about Jewish students and synagogues being threatened in our state in the aftermath of 9-11. We made sure that we sent federal agents to those synagogues and we protected them, and the same thing should be being done now. At the very same time, I personally went from mosque to mosque in New Jersey and met with the leaders of those mosques and 
with the members of the mosques. And I said to them, law enforcement is on your side to protect you, regardless of your religion, if you are going to comply with the law. And we developed fabulous relationships with Muslim Americans all across the state of New Jersey, and we stopped any hate crimes that were going on either against Jewish Americans in New Jersey or Muslim Americans in New Jersey. It takes leadership, Lester, to know how to do this. You must work with both sides. Both sides need to know it, but let us never have a false moral equivalence between Hamas and Hezbollah and the Jewish people. The Jewish people stand for right and justice, and Hamas Governor, and Hezbollah stand for death. Governor Chrissy, thank you. A Ambassador Haley, what do you say to Americans who are simply afraid right now in this, in this current environment that we're talking about? I think, it, you know, you look at the, the country and the country is all out of sorts. I think, look at what these kids are dealing with on college campuses. What makes me so angry is not only do you have the kids barricaded in the library, they've said they were going to shoot up the kosher dining hall. You've got kids' dorm rooms who are being set on fire because they have something related to Israel on their doors. No person should ever feel in danger like this. And this is what I would say about our college presidents, is if the KKK were doing this, every college president would be up in arms. This is no different. You should treat it exactly the same. Anti-Semitism is just as awful as racism, and we've got to make sure they're protected. And for everybody that's protesting on these college campuses in favor of Hamas, let me remind you something. Hamas said death to Israel and death to America. They hate and would kill you too. And the idea that they're talking about genocide for the Jewish people, that's not the values of America. That's not us. We're better than that. We don't need to celebrate terrorists. We don't need to celebrate genocide. We don't need to celebrate violence towards anybody. We need to go back and soul search in our country and remember what we are about. And we are about taking care of people, not going and making them live in fear because some other terrorist activity says they want to destroy them. Ambassador, thank you. Kristen. Lester, thank you. This is another question for the entire field, so you will all get a chance to respond. But, Senator Scott, I'd like to start with you. The United States has given Ukraine financial and military support since the war began more than 600 days ago. President Zelensky told me on Sunday, if Russia isn't stopped now, quote, the price will be higher for the United States, and Americans would be forced to, quote, send your sons and daughters to defend NATO countries. Senator Scott, where do you stand on more funding for Ukraine? Well, I certainly have been very supportive of Ukraine. I believe that ultimately we should make sure that the President of the United States states what is America's national vital interest in Ukraine. It is actually in degrading the Russian military. We have been very effective using our resources and our weaponry and the incredibly high price of Ukrainian blood to achieve that objective. Every day we get closer to the degradation of the Russian military, and that's good news. But the American people are frustrated that they do not have a president who reminds us and tells us, where's the accountability? Where are those dollars? How are those dollars being spent? We need those answers for us to continue to see the support for Ukraine. And at the same time, I would say that a package, a package that's been offered by the president for Ukraine and Israel, that's the wrong approach. We need to focus specifically on providing Israel with the $14 billion that they need so that we show the world that we are 100% undeniably standing shoulder to shoulder with Israel. And then as we turn away from that direct support for Israel, we should go to our southern border and close our southern border with the resources necessary. I believe that we have sleeper terrorist cells in America. Thousands of people have come from Yemen, Iran, Syria, and Iraq. If we are going to deal with the national security emergency at our border, Senator we have Scott. to do it now. Senator Scott, thank you. But just to be very clear, if you were president, if you were in the Oval Office today, would you sign off on more military funding for Ukraine, or would you discontinue it? Bottom line is we have to first have the level of accountability that allows the American people to understand where the resources have gone. 
number one. Number two, after we have that, that responsibility taken care of and accountability, then we have an opportunity to look at the overall strategy that helps us degrade the Russian military while we use our resources and, frankly, keeping our NATO partners safe from the Russian military is absolutely essential. As you understand, Article 5 would require to support and to defend NATO, our troops on the ground. The fastest way for us to eliminate that possibility is for us to destroy, to the extent possible, the Russian military. By doing so, we actually achieve the objective of keeping our military Thank home. You. And that's good news. Thank you, Senator Scott. Mr. Ramaswamy, are you persuaded by President Zelensky's urgent new plea? Where do you stand on more funding? I'm absolutely unpersuaded. And I'm actually enjoying watching the Ukraine hawks quietly, delicately tiptoe back from their position as this thing has unwound into a disaster. The first half of this race, I was the only person standing for it. Now they're actually quietly coming around to being more cautious as they should. Level with the American people here. Ukraine is not a paragon of democracy. This is a country that has banned 11 opposition parties. It has consolidated all media into one state TV media arm. That's not democratic. It has threatened not to hold elections this year unless the U.S. forks over more money. That is not democratic. It has celebrated a Nazi in its ranks, the comedian in cargo pants, a man called Zelensky, doing it in their own ranks. That is not democratic. More facts for you that you won't hear from the mainstream in either party or the mainstream media. The regions of Ukraine that are occupied by Russia right now in the Donbass, Luhansk, Donetsk, these are Russian-speaking regions that have not even been part of Ukraine since 2014, that other people probably couldn't name those provinces for you. Those are the hard facts. And so to frame this as some kind of battle between good versus evil, don't buy it. And I'd like the likes of the, the sharpest of the war hawks on Ukraine, Nikki Haley, to have some accountability and answer. Do you want to use U.S. taxpayer money to fund the banning of Christians? That is actually what's happening. They're using the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. They have banned them. The Ukrainian parliament just did this last week, supported by our dollars. And I think you owe it to the American people, Nikki, to at least this Mr. one time Ramaswamy, at least condemn, thank you. That's time. At least Mr. to condemn Ramaswamy, their banning you. of Christians. Mr. Ramaswamy, or else thank we're you. Out of both sides Mr. Ramaswamy, of thank you. We asked the questions. <laughs> Ambassador Haley, well, what is your take on more funding for Ukraine? I am telling you, Putin and President Xi are salivating at the thought that someone like that could become president. They would love to the see that. The fact of the matter is she doesn't answer the question. So this is question. what I will tell you. We're driving is, Russia first of all, into China's hands because of these foolish policies. You had your time policies. to talk. The ambassador has the floor. Ambassador, Thank you. Please. The first thing I'll tell you is we all remember what that thug did when he invaded Ukraine. We all know that half a million people have died because of Putin. And here is a freedom-loving, pro-American country that is fighting for its survival and its democracy. No, I don't think we should give them cash. I think we should give them the equipment and the ammunition to win. And I'll tell you, if Biden had done it when they first asked for it, this war would be over. But let's also remember this. When you left Afghanistan in shambles and left them with a ton of weapons and money, it's not that we left, it's how we left. When you look at Ukraine, don't think for a second, now everybody wants to move away from Ukraine, they'll want to move away from Israel a year from now. America can never be so arrogant to think we don't need friends. After 9-11, we needed a lot of friends. Now is the time to get partnerships. This unholy alliance between Russia, Ukraine, and China is real. There is a reason that Taiwanese want us to support the Ukrainians. It's because they know that China is coming after them next. There is a reason Ukrainians want us to support Israelis, because they know that if Iran wins, Russia wins. Ambassador, we have to see the combination of the three. Ambassador, thank you. Governor Christie, what is your take, and how long should Americans be expected to help fund the war in Ukraine? Kristen, let's remember the last time that we turned our back on a shooting war in Europe. It bought us just a couple of years. And then 500,000 Americans were killed in Europe to defeat Hitler. This is not a choice. This is the price we pay for being the leaders of the free world. And the fact is, this alliance is not just with Russia and China. Governor Haley knows this. Iran is in the middle of this as well, and so is North Korea. And they are all working to support Russia right now. And the reason they're doing it is because dictators work together. People who believe in democracy work together. We must stand with all of those 
that are standing up for democracy and freedom in this world. And by the way, let's remind everybody of this. In 1992, this country made a promise to Ukraine. We said if you return nuclear missiles that were part of the old Soviet Union to Russia and they invade you, we will protect you. An American promise that's 31 years old is no different than an American promise that's made tonight on this stage. We need to stand by it. And those of us who forget history are doomed to repeat it. And the, I'd like to respond. And the absolute, the absolute giving in to dictators, which is being suggested on this stage, just shows the immaturity of the approach. I'd Governor like to Christie, respond. thank you. Governor DeSantis, I'd like you to weigh in on this idea. Are you concerned that this could become a wider war if Putin is not stopped now? Well, any suggestion by Zelensky or anyone else that we should, that we're going to eventually have U.S. troops there, I can tell the American people when I'm president, that will not happen. We are not going to send your sons and daughters to Ukraine. Uh, I am going to send troops to our southern border. If you look at the threats that we face, terrorists have come in through our southern border. I'm going to shut it down. I'm going to have the military, and I'm going to deport the people who've come, particularly under Biden, who've come from the Middle East, come from all these places. Now, Biden wants $105 billion. Uh, 60, most of that's Ukraine, including some of it going to pay pensions for bureaucrats and salaries. That is a totally ridiculous use of American tax dollars. He says he has money for border to try to do, and the media will repeat that. When you look at it, what most of the money is, is money to process more illegal aliens into this country. How is that solving the problem? That's making the problem worse. And what does he do for the Indo-Pacific? A pittance. That is the top threat that we face. We need to bring this war to an end. We need the Europeans to step up and do their fair share. And we need to get serious about the top threat that this country faces, which is the Chinese Communist Party. So if I Thank may you, respond Governor. to the Ukraine you. question. In fact, we are going to go from the hot wars in Ukraine and Gaza and Israel to what many people are calling the new Cold War with China. And I remind the audience that it's important for our visitors at home to be able to hear you, and especially for the people in Beijing to hear you. Many Republicans believe that the Chinese Communist Party and General Secretary Xi is an existential threat to the United States. The flashpoint is Taiwan. For decades and decades, the American military, but primarily the United States Navy, has deterred an attack from China to the island state of Taiwan. But Ronald Reagan's Navy of 600 ships is gone. Now, the question to you is, and I'll start with you, Ambassador Haley, because you were in President Trump's cabinet. His goal was a 355-ship Navy. That's what he pushed for. He got to 300. It's now at 291. Is that big enough to deter and, if necessary, defeat an invasion of Taiwan? China has the largest naval fleet in the world. They have 350 ships. They'll have 400 ships in two years. We won't even have 350 ships in two decades. China has built up their military. It's not just land, air, and sea. They're doing cyber. They're doing artificial intelligence. They're doing space. America needs to modernize our military. We need to do everything we can. The first thing is you go and you make sure you have the back of you, backs of Ukraine. That's why the Taiwanese want us to support Ukraine, because they know that sends the biggest message to China. The second thing is we go to China and we start being tough on them. No more sales of our American soil to China, and let's take back what they've already stolen. Then you go and you to the universities. No more having millions of dollars go to our universities. Then we will go and end all for formal trade relations with China until they stop murdering Americans from fentanyl, something Ron has yet to say that he's going to do. And then we modernize our military. When we strengthen our military, when we modernize it with the focus of cyber, artificial intelligence, and space, when we make sure that we have the backs of our friends, whether it's in Israel, whether it's in Ukraine, and we should be arming Taiwan. Make sure they have the equipment they need. Make sure they have the training they need now. There is nothing China fears more than knowing that America will have Taiwan's back. Let's make sure that we show it by making sure they have the equipment they need. Governor DeSantis, my question is specifically about the Navy. It's at 291. It's going to go down perhaps as low as 280. Is it enough? And what would you build if you were going to build more? Not enough. We have to have the ability to back up a strategy of denial of President Xi's ambitions. And if China is able to be the world's leading superpower, that will affect you and your family in ways that are going to be very bad. They will export authoritarianism all around the world as the cost of doing business. They will impose things like social credit scores and Internet monitoring. So this is 
to this generation what the Soviet Union was to the post-World War II generation. I've already released a plan. We're going to get to 355 ships at the end of the first term, 385 ships at the end of the second term, but we're going to have a path to 600 ships over the next 20 years. I think the future of freedom is going to be determined in the Indo-Pacific. We have a strategy not, with mil not just military, but decoupling from the economy and fighting them here at home with their cultural. You know, Ambassador Haley said somehow I wasn't doing. She welcomed them into South Carolina gave them land near a military base, wrote the Chinese ambassador a love letter saying what a great friend they were. That was like their number one way to do, to do economic development. In Florida, I banned China from buying land in this state, and we kicked out so on our universities, stop. and we kicked the Confucius Institutes out of our universities. We've recognized the threat, and we've acted swiftly and decisively. Senator Scott, you've been in the Congress since 2011. Defense spending has fallen over that entire period of Absolutely. time. Where are we going to get the money, and what would you build, and what kind of ships to deter China from attacking Taiwan? Well, two major problems with the, with the question. Number one, uh, we do not have currently a defense industrial bank to allow us to have the kind of production that we need in order to keep America safe. Frankly, if we are not prepared to fight and engage in three continents at the same time, think about where we are today. In the Middle East, we are in the midst of trying to back our strongest ally. In Eastern Europe, we've seen our resources and our weaponry help degrade the Russian military. The Indo-Pacific, we have real challenges. The long-term threat, the long-term threat is China. Immediate threat is our southern border. In order for us to have the military to fight three different con continents at the exact same time, we are going to have to invest heavily in our military, but we're also going to have to invest heavily in an industrial base so that we can hit our objectives from a military perspective, not only with our ships, but also with our, air, with our planes. We are so old as a military that in order for us to recalibrate, we're going to have to invest. One of the things I do in my Made in America strategy is we create more than 4 million new jobs by having high-tech manufacturing come back to America, decoupling from China, so that we focus our attention on creating that industrial revolution that will be necessary for us to achieve the goal of having a military that is ready to be lethal and come home safe. Thank you, Senator. Mr. Ramaswamy, I'm looking for specifics. What would you build? Where would you build it? When would they be in the water? How big would the fleet get? First answer is end the toxic divest to invest program. For people who don't know about that, we're decommissioning ships in the South China Sea. The foundation of war is economics. Rebuild our defense industrial base at home. But here's the dirty little secret. Our actual defense industrial base depends on China for the supply chain, for the F-35 jets, for the ships that we're building. Think about this. Why are we stockpiling that if it isn't to actually be strong against our enemy, China? We depend on them for that just like we depend on them for pharmaceuticals, just like we depend on them for semiconductors. So here's why we can't get tough with China. It's because we depend on them for our modern way of life, and we have to declare economic independence from our enemy. That's the Declaration of Independence that Thomas Jefferson, at the age of 33, would have signed. And today, if he were alive, that's the Declaration of Independence that I will sign as the next president. I do have to recognize that Ron DeSantis was correct about acknowledging Nikki Haley's tough talk when she was ambassador to the UN, calling China our great friend, bringing the CCP to South Carolina. What he left out, though, Ron, and be honest about it, there was a lobbying-based exemption in that bill that allowed Chinese nationals to buy land within a 20-mile radius of a military base lobbied for by one of your donors. So I think we have to call a spade a spade. We That's need politicians true. who are independent of the forces that increase our dependence on China. My message to Xi Jinping is this. You are done buying land in this country. You will not donate to universities in this country. U.S. businesses won't expand into the Chinese market until you play by the same set of Mr. rules. Ramaswamy, You're kicked out of the WTO, following. and you actually have to have accountability for the COVID-19 pandemic financially, you, which unleashed hell on the world. We have to hold them accountable. Do you have a number and a plan? I think that we need to increase our naval capacity by at least 20 percent over the course of the next several years. I think we have to, at minimum, be able to meet our AUKUS agreement standards. Right now, we are at risk of not even being able to meet our AUKUS standards with, with Australia and the UK. So what we need to do is have a plan that reverses the trajectory of the divest Thank to you. invest program Gee, I'd like to by 20 percent over the next three years. Governor Christie? 
You know, my first observation, Hugh, is that nobody answers your question. And, and my second observation is these three in the middle think they're the enemy. I know China is the enemy, and that's what we should be focused on. So let's be really clear. The nuclear submarines in this United States Navy is the greatest deterrent to Chinese aggression, and that is the first place I would go to increase American naval power. Our nuclear submarines are able to move stealthily, quietly, and effectively, and if we are going to deter China from invading Taiwan, the only way we're going to do it is to make sure that they don't know whether how many nuclear submarines from the United States of America are in the South China Sea and in that area and ready to strike on them if they decide to move on Taiwan. And so we, as our first priority, need to go directly to our nuclear sub-program queue, and we need to increase it drastically. That would be priority number one. Ships would come next, but to me, the ships are secondary choice here. The, the submarines are the single most important thing that we could be deterring, that we could be using to deter China. But the other thing we could do to deter China is to let them know that the blood money they're spending for Russia in Ukraine right now will not be effective. That we send Putin home with his tail between his legs and make them understand that the same fate waits for them if they decide to move towards Taiwan with a more aggressive nuclear sub-program. We'll be able to make that threat real. Thank you, Governor. We're going to take a brief pause now and we'll be back to the Republican presidential primary debate. Please stay tuned. to tonight's NBC News Republican presidential debate. Once again, here's Hugh Hewitt. Thank you, Lester. We're going to stay on China, and we're going to talk specifically about TikTok. Last week, Congressman Mike Gallagher, who is chairman of the House Bipartisan Select Committee on the Chinese Communist Party, published a long essay on TikTok following the flooding of pro-Hamas propaganda under TikTok accounts across the United States. Chairman Gallagher called it shocking. He called the app predatory, controlled by America's preeminent adversary, one used to push propaganda and divide America. It's spyware, he said, a means of surveillance. Governor Christie, do you agree with Chairman Gallagher? And if so, would you ban or force the sale of TikTok? I agree 100% with Chairman Gallagher. And let me say this. TikTok is not only spyware, it is polluting the minds of American young people all throughout this country, and they're doing it intentionally. And when you saw what happened in the last few weeks with all of this anti-Semitic, horrible stuff that their algorithms were pushing out at a gargantuan rate, this is China trying to further divide the United States of America. And this is one of the big failings among many of the Trump administration. He talked tough about TikTok. I heard him do it many times. But when it came down to it, he did not ban them when he could have and should have. And now since then, we've had an additional nearly six years of this type of poison being put out throughout the United States, even putting aside the spying, which we know is going on in the theft of American personal data and information. So in my first week as president, we would ban TikTok. They want to go ahead and sell it? Let them go ahead and sell it. But I'll tell you another reason we would do it. Facebook's not in China. X is not in China. They're not permitting a free flow of information to the Chinese people from our social media companies, yet we just open the door and let them do what they're doing. TikTok should be banned because they are poisoning American minds, and I would do it week one. Thank you, Governor. I want to go to Governor DeSantis. Would you ban or force the sale of TikTok, regardless of whether or not China allowed American apps to operate in China? Yes, I think that China is the top threat we face. They've been very effective at infiltrating different parts of our society. So my policy on China and the Chinese Communist Party is very simple. We win, they lose. And in order to do that, it's not just military. It's economic 
and it's cultural. And as the dad of a 6'5 and a 3-year-old, I'm concerned about the data that they're getting from our young people and what they're doing to pollute the minds of our young people. These kids get these devices and they have a mind of their own. And I know a lot of parents are looking. It's hard to even keep it out. China's obviously the, the most extreme, but this is happening with other things. So we are going to do that and we are going to make sure to protect the American people. It's a full spectrum approach to be able to fend China off. Yes, military deterrence. Yes, economic uh, decoupling but also their role in our culture. If we, don't, if we ignore that, we're not going to be able to win the fight. Thank you, Governor. Ambassador Haley, speak to the parents out there. There are probably TikTok apps on half the phones in this uh, auditorium. Speak no, I'm going to speak to the fact that two people hit me and you didn't let me respond. So let's first talk about the fact that they want to talk about the Chinese land from 10 years ago. Yes, I brought a fiberglass company 10 years ago to South Carolina, but Ron, you are the chair of your economic development agency that as of last week said Florida is the ideal place for Chinese businesses. Not only that, you have a company that is manufacturer of Chinese military planes. You have it, they are expanding two training sites at two of your airports now, one which is 12 miles away from a naval base. Then you have another company that's expanding and they were just invaded by the Department of Homeland Security. So mine was 10 years ago. You gave Yours them was stuff. Six I didn't ago. give them anything. What's your story? And I abolished that agency that she's talking about. No, Enterprise he... Florida, we abolished it. And of course, we banned he China from buying the land. the website Not last exactly week. a Go great check. recruiting pitch if you're banning them from purchasing you land at all. The so we stood up week. and done the right thing in Florida. Mr. Ramaswamy, uh, we've talked about this. You campaign on TikTok. How do you get TikTok banned if you use it? Well, I, I, I want to laugh at why Nikki Haley didn't answer your question, which is about looking at families in the eye. In the last debate, she made fun of me for actually joining TikTok while her own daughter was actually using the app for a long time. So you might want to take care of your family first. Leave my daughter out of your voice. Adult daughter. The next generation of Americans are using it. And that's actually the point. You have her supporters crapping her up. That's fine. Here's the truth. You're just the easy scum. answer is actually to say that we're just going to ban one app. We got to go further. We have to ban any U.S. company actually transferring U.S. data to the Chinese. Here's a story most people don't know. Airbnb hands over U.S. user data to the CCP. Now, that's a U.S.-owned company. So this is the problem when you have Republicans that temporarily go the way the winds blow, and now it's popular to talk tough on China when she was U.N. ambassador, called them literally her words, not mine, our great friend. You can't be fair-weather fans of the right policy. Get to the root cause. Even U.S. companies in Silicon Valley are regularly doing it. Cut the virtue signaling. The fact of the matter is Democrats are on TikTok today. The only person, one of the few people who is putting up content the way the actual algorithms work, speaking for pro-Israel views or others, is Ambassador me, Haley, um, more Republicans will join it. But uh, stop U.S. companies from turning over data to Chinese companies. That's the real answer. Like, uh, the Kristen, signal. don't get to respond to personal attacks, but you do. Thank you very much. You know, when he talks about me praising China, he doesn't know the fact that the reason China was praised was because I negotiated with China and Russia the largest set of sanctions against North Korea in a generation. We are the, that is literally the reason North Korea stopped testing ballistic missiles. So I said China did good on their part. That was a negotiation you, said they were you could never do. what you said, Nikki. Those are your words, not mine. And so just when, own up to you it. You would never you can have been able to mind. get That's that allowed. negotiation done. But don't done. lie to the people about what you've said or what you've done in China, South Carolina. My entire you have brought them to South Carolina. The Ron is right Nations. about that. Every day I fought China. And I did it Look at the by making sure no one could get any country. agency heads in UN. I did it by making sure that we called them out on human rights. I did it by making sure that we held them accountable on everything that they did. That's the reason we got out of Human Rights Council. That's the reason we I, called them out. And I have, there's not been a day I haven't Nikki stopped. Senator Scott, was it is your turn. Mr. Ramaswamy. Made afterwards. Everybody else is hanging on to the rules here, Mr. Ramaswamy. Senator Scott. Thank you. We should. I appreciate y'all clapping for me already. This is wonderful. Answer. I love this. <laughs> Without any question, what we should do is ban TikTok, period. Now, we saw under former President Trump, he tried to ban TikTok twice, but was struck down by our federal courts. If you cannot ban TikTok, you should eliminate the Chinese presence on the app. 
period. We also should provide, in my parents' Bill of Rights, we give parents the opportunity to give their kids permission under 14 to be on those apps. I think it's incredibly important for us as Americans to take back control of the information, especially of our kids. Where does it go? We should know that. One of the ways that we get to know that is by having a parental consent. But if we can eliminate TikTok, that is a first step. But it's not just TikTok. China continues to spy on our kids, but they're also buying our farmlands. We talked about that several times there. We have to make sure that we use the tools that are in our toolkit to stop China from buying farmland near our bases. The third thing we have to do is make sure that they stop stealing our intellectual property. They're literally stealing our IP to compete against us. My administration, we stopped that day one, and we start making sure that we create six-figure income for jobs made in America you, through my strategy. Kristen. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're now going to talk about Venezuela, where millions have fled political and economic turmoil. Many Venezuelan immigrants are settling right here in Florida. Former President Trump and President Biden have taken different approaches to Nicolas Maduro's regime with little result. Former President Trump put economic pressure on Venezuela and backed one of Maduro's rivals. President Biden temporarily eased sanctions to encourage electoral reforms. Governor DeSantis, do you see the political situation in Venezuela as a threat to the United States, and what would your approach be? We should never rely on Venezuela for oil like Biden has had to go beg. I'm going to unleash all of America's energy potential. On day one, I'm taking all the Biden regulations, the Green New Deal, ripping it up and throwing it in the trash can where it belongs. We're going to lower your gas prices. We're going to create jobs. We're going to lower energy costs. But we're also going to be more energy independent and secure. We'll choose Midland over Moscow. We'll choose the Marcellus over the Mullahs. And we'll choose Bakken over Beijing. That is good for America's national security. Biden's Green New Deal, that's good for Venezuela, it's good for Russia, it's good for Iran, and it's good for China. So I would turn the screws on the Venezuelan regime. I think it's a corrupt, dictatorial regime, and we should never go hat in hand begging for oil from them. Just to be clear, would you reimpose the sanctions? Yes, absolutely. Ambassador Haley, what would your approach be? You know, I stood on the Simon Boulevard Bridge and watched thousands of Venezuelans cross in the for hours in the hot sun holding their babies to get the one meal they might get that day going from Venezuela to Colombia. They were fleeing socialism and begging for freedom. We need to make sure that we do everything we can to sanction Maduro. We shouldn't be getting dirty oil. And Biden just gave 500,000 Venezuelans temporary priority status, which is just going to have more of them come. But on the energy side, it cracks me up that Ron continues to do this. He has opposed fracking. He's opposed drilling. Last time he said it wasn't true, and he, everybody found out that it was true. He no. opposed it before Florida voters even it's voted on it. He was praised by the Sierra Club, and you're trying to make up for it and act like you weren't you weren't a liberal when it comes to the environment. You were. You always have been. Just own it well, if that's the case. But don't keep saying you're something that you're not. Let me respond to that. Um, response, go. So uh, our whole energy plan. You can't get the shale without fracking. We are absolutely going to frack, but I disagree with Nikki Haley. I don't think it's a good idea to drill in the Florida Everglades, and I know most Floridians agree with me. You banned right. fracking. Thank you very much. Lester? All right, all, thank you. Let's turn to one of the biggest issues for voters. That, of course, is the economy. This is a question that will go to all of you. An Iowa voter recently told NBC News, how am I going to make sure my pantry stock without breaking the bank? You've all said the best way to deal with rising prices is to cut government spending. But that would take time to play out, and Americans are struggling right now. Senator Scott, I'll start with you. What would you do the moment you take office to help Americans manage the cost of living? So we're talking about short term here. My mother was a single mother who raised me and my brother in a very challenging economic situation. 
The first thing I can tell you is that when your gas prices are 40 percent higher right now than they were just a little over two years ago, that's not a problem for my mama. That was a crisis. The first thing I would do as President of the United States is I would sign the XL Keystone Pipeline and start seeing resources flow. Second thing I would do is make sure that there's certainty and predictability so that those folks who have the leases in our country would have the certainty and predictability to go ahead and become energy independent. We should focus not just on being energy independent. We should focus on being energy dominant. America is the home to more energy resources than any other country on the planet. We can reduce the price of energy. We can reduce the price of food and the price of electricity if we focus on my build here, don't borrow from China plan that is embedded the Made in America strategy creates 10 million new jobs in three different areas. One is innovation. Second is the high-tech manufacturing. And the third is the energy economy. We have an opportunity as Americans to actually export the surplus energy that we create in our nation and disconnect from China and from murderous dictators and tyrants around the world. Your time is up, but let me just follow up. The idea of pumping gas, of of turning on pipelines, that doesn't put, make gas cheaper that day. I'm talking about you become president. What can you do specifically to help people feel better about their situation or be better with their situation? Well, Well, actually it does, to be honest with you. The way that the economy works is it works on the ability to anticipate excess supply versus the demand. When that happens, Confidence drives our prices down because we know there's going to be a greater surplus. When you allow for those who have leases to actually start drilling, to start using those leases for for more energy excavation, you put our economy in the strongest position, and as a result of that, prices start going down. That is the kind of economy that, as President of the United States, I would lead this nation to making sure that we first use the resources in our own country and not going outside of our country in order to achieve our objective. You know, Proverbs 22, 7 reminds us that the borrower is slave to the lender. We have become an indentured servant too often to countries like China. By having an energy economy, we start allowing this nation to once again return. Senator, thank you. Let me let me uh, ask the same question to Governor DeSantis. Can you give us some? You you ticked off a number of things a moment ago, but some specific examples of ways that would 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 put people on a, a better economic footing right away. So I started off working minimum wage jobs. I did $6 an hour as an electrician's assistant. I worked all kinds of things to be able to get through school. And I did that because I believed in America, if you work hard and get the most out of your God-given ability, you can get ahead. And what's happening now, many of you are working hard and you're falling further and further behind. I've met people in Iowa, New Hampshire, and all across the country who've talked about all the burdens that they're facing with the rising prices. And I've heard from multiple people the same story. When they go grocery shopping, what they now do is they figure out what they have to take out of the cart once it's ringing up because it rings up so much faster and so much higher at the cash register that they can't afford the full cart of groceries anymore. We have to restore the American dream in this country. What can you do on day one? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take all the executive orders, the regulations, everything involving Bidenomics, I'm going to rip it up, and I'm going to throw it in the trash can on day one where it belongs. That is going to give the economy breathing room, and I'm also going to rein in the Federal Reserve. They have helped create, uh, with their reckless monetary policy, what we have faced since the COVID-19 pandemic. They botched it. Congress botched it. Both parties are to blame. Fed should focus on stable prices. They are not an economic central planner for the American people. Governor, thank you. Mr. Ramaswamy, weigh in on this. Ways that you can improve people's financial condition in the short term. Right. And as a CEO, the economic question is core to my vision and policy prescription for this country. Increase the supply of everything. It's the law of supplies and demand. Increase the supply of energy. That brings down the cost of energy, grows the economy. Drill, frack, burn coal, embrace nuclear. Increase the supply of labor in this country. Stop using our taxpayer money to pay people more to stay at home instead of to go to work. Increase the supply of housing. 
People don't talk about this one in the Republican Party. The land use restrictions are constricting the supply of housing. That's making housing more expensive for ordinary Americans across this country. So that's the true answer. And I think it takes a CEO in the White House who actually understands this to get this done. Because Americans at home, they know the Bidenomics is a lie. Prices are going up. Interest rates and mortgages to buy your home are going up. But wages have remained flat. That's the hard diagnosis for our economy. And this is about more than just our economy. I say this as a member of my generation. I'm 38 years old. I'm the youngest person ever to run for U.S. president as a Republican. The reason my generation has lost our sense of national pride in part is because people in my generation feel like the American dream isn't available to them. And part of the reason why is we've burdened them with four-year college degrees that did not serve their head start on the American dream. People will be more proud of a country if we're all making more money in that country. This is how we revive national pride and our identity, and it will take a CEO in the White House with zero-based budgeting, by the way, to take on Mr. the federal Ramos debt Swami, thank to get you. this Let me job turn done. to Governor Christie on that. Well, look, Lester, part of the, the, part of the entire premise of the question, and I agree with Tim on this, is absolutely energy is the key to this because it drives every one of those other prices. You know, now food gets to your grocery store, it gets trucked. And those truckers have to pay for fuel, for the higher fuel prices. And when you go ahead and you tell people, we are going to unleash every bit of American energy, every bit of its potential, what happens in the futures markets? The prices go down. Because those people who are believing that the Biden program will continue are the ones who are bidding this up. And let me tell you the other place that's bidding it up, in the Middle East. And so if you don't believe that making sure that Israel and that Israel situation that's going on right now isn't resolved and resolved quickly as president of the United States and bring stability back, that will also not permit countries like Saudi Arabia and others to be able to jack their prices as well in what they say is in response to a crisis, when it's really what it's in response to is putting more money in their pockets. When they have an American president who knows that Israel must be defended not with humanitarian pauses and not with suggestions for ceasefire, but with letting them know we will supply them with everything they need, that will also bring stability to the market. Energy is the key to bringing this down. It's what every American family needs when they turn on their lights, fill up their car, and go to the grocery store. And we need to do that first and foremost. That's the short-term answer. Governor Christie, thank you. Ambassador Haley, let me come at this from a slightly different direction. <laughs> Americans in rural communities are being especially squeezed by inflation right now. An Iowa State University study found that last year inflation cost rural households about an extra $5,000. How would you specifically help rural Americans who are suffering right now, Ambassador? Well, I'm a product of rural America. I grew up in rural South Carolina. And I can tell you what we're seeing now in America is the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poor. We have to go and start beefing up the middle class. And the first thing I would do is I will eliminate the federal um, gas and diesel tax in this country. We'll cut taxes on the middle class, but we have to stop the spending binge that's happening by Republicans and Democrats in Congress. I will make sure, one, we claw back the $500 billion of unspent COVID dollars that are out there. Instead of 87,000 IRS agents going after middle America, we'll go after the hundreds of billions of dollars of COVID fraud that exist, one out of every $7. We'll stop the spending. We'll stop the borrowing. We'll eliminate the earmarks. And I'll veto any spending bill that doesn't go back to pre-COVID levels. That will cut trillions and allow us to be safe. We also need to be not energy independent, energy dominant. We are blessed with resources, let's do it. But the reason no one should give you a number, Hugh, on the amount of ships in the Navy is because in a few years, our interest expense is gonna be more than our defense budget. So no one can give you that number realistically without first tackling what's happening with the financial situation. It would be a false number to give you that. We have got to understand this is a crisis. It is a national security concern. If we don't deal with what's gonna happen with that interest expense in a few years, we're gonna look like Japan and we can't let that happen. A the strong dollar matters. Ambassador, thank you very much. Christian. Americans could see 
Americans could see their Social Security benefits drastically cut in the next decade because the program is running out of money. Former President Trump has said, quote, under no circumstances should Republicans cut entitlements. Governor Christie, first to you, you have proposed raising the retirement age for younger Americans. What would that age be specifically, and would you consider making any other reforms to Social Security? Sure, and we have to deal with this problem. Now, look, if we raise the retirement age a few years for folks that are in their 30s and 40s, uh, I have a son who's in the audience tonight who's 30 years old. If he can't adjust to a few-year increase in Social Security retirement age over the next 40 years, i got bigger problems with him than his Social Security payments. Okay. And the fact is we need to be realistic about this. There are only three things that go into determining whether Social Security can be solvent or not. Retirement age, eligibility for the program in general, and taxes. That's it. We are already overtaxed in this country, and we should not raise those taxes. But on eligibility also, I don't know if out there tonight, and if you're watching, Warren, um, I don't know if Warren Buffett is collecting Social Security, but if he is, shame on you. You shouldn't be taking the money. There are a lot of programs in this country that we all pay for that we don't get a direct benefit from. Food stamps is one of them. I've never, fortunately in my life, ever had me or my family on food stamps. But I'm glad it's there so that no one in this country goes to bed hungry at night if they have availability to that program. But I don't get a direct benefit. The fact is on Social Security, remember why it was established. It was established as a safety net program to make sure that no one would grow old in this country in poverty. That's what we got to get back to. Rich people should not be collecting Social Security. Governor, can you give me a specific age, 69, 70? What would the age be? No, look, that's going to be a part of a negotiation with Congress, Kirsten. And hell, I'm not going to start negotiating until I get there. All right, Ambassador Haley, let me have you weigh in on this because you said in June that you would be open to raising the retirement age. Have you determined what that age would be specifically, and what other reforms are you looking at? So first of all, any candidate that tells you that they're not going to take on entitlements is not being serious. Social Security will go bankrupt in 10 years. Medicare will go bankrupt in eight. Right now, you have Ron and Trump joining Biden and Pelosi saying they're not going to change or do any sort of entitlement reform. What we need to do is keep our promises. Those that have been promised should keep it. But for like my kids in their 20s, you go and you say, we're going to change the rules. You change the retirement age for them. Instead of cost of living increases, we should go to increases based on inflation. We should lim limit benefits on the wealthy. Bernie Marcus can tell you he hates getting that check. Limit the benefits on the we wealthy and then expand Medicare Advantage plans. Seniors love that. And let's make sure we do that so that they can have more competition. That's how we'll deal with entitlement reform. And that's how we'll start to pay down this debt. And can you give me a specific age? Have you determined the age? Again, you have to work with Chris. What I can tell you is you can it's going to be those in their 20s just coming into the system and it should reflect more of life expectancy it doesn't do that now all right mr ramaswamy have you determined if you would touch entitlements and social security what if any reforms are you looking at so this is really important right now we're working within the last window i believe we will have to actually fix this problem while still leaving social security and medicare benefits for current seniors intact i'll tell you how the other candidates assume, like Nikki, that it can't be done. And on her math, she's right about it. But her math assumes $7 trillion of our $33 trillion national debt going to fight wars like in places like Iraq and Afghanistan. Minus that, our national debt would be $26 trillion right now. Then you go to zero-based budgeting, which I've proposed as a CEO. It's how I've run businesses. It's how many CEOs run businesses. Don't use last year's budget as the baseline. Start with zero as the baseline and then ask what's actually necessary. 75% headcount reduction. Yes, that is severe. In the number of federal employees in the Washington, D.C. bureaucracy. Shut down redundant agencies that should not exist. Deliver economic growth as a positive tailwind. I think we can get to three, four, maybe even 5% GDP growth if we really take the regulatory shackles off of our economy. And against that backdrop, I believe this is our last best window to be able to take care of our national debt problem through those severe measures, including sacrificing the foreign wars that many bloodthirsty members of both parties have a hunger for. That's the one secret for how we're going to be able to do this, and that requires discipline. So we can't have the first conversation we were having sending foreign aid willy-nilly to countries whose 
national debt per capita is less than ours. Thank you, But Mr. if we Robinson. do this correctly, I think this is our last window, and it'll take a CEO from the next Thank generation you. to do it. Thank you very much. Senator Scott, weigh in here. What are yeah. you looking at to keep Social Security sustainable? The bottom line is a simple one. We have to grow our economy and cut our spending. Let me just say to my mama and to every other mama or grandfather receiving Social Security, as President of the United States, I will protect your Social Security. The fact is that we're spending today about $1.1 trillion on Social Security, about $750 billion on Medicare, about $300 billion on Medicaid, about $400 billion on veterans' benefits, $1.7 trillion on annual appropriations. If we're going to actually tame this tiger, the way you do it is not by picking on seniors who have paid into a program that deserve their money coming back out to them. The way you deal with it is, number one, you have to grow your economy. My plan, Made in America, creates 10 million new jobs, grows our economy at 5%. By doing so, you add trillions of dollars of economic activity and billions of dollars to your treasury. Number two, you have to cut taxes. When we cut taxes in 2017, I wrote the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Everybody I said, well, guess what? Revenue will go down. Well, in 2018, after we wrote it in 2017, what happened? Revenue went up by 3%, and the next year, it went up by another 3%. So what we know is that the laugher curve still works, but the lower the tax, the higher the revenue. And finally, if we're going to deal with it, we have to take our annual appropriations back to pre-2020, pre-COVID levels of spending, which would save us about a half a trillion dollars in the next budget window. By doing Senator, that, we deal with Social you. Security and our mandatory spending. Thank you, Senator. Very quickly, would you raise the retirement age? Would you be open to raising the retirement age, or do you rule that out? All you have to do is go to a farm in Iowa and watch the hard work and the dedication. Yes you or no, You and I though, having Senator. a conversation. Yes or the no, The answer though. is no, but going, okay. listen to this, though, before you go on. Thank you. The fact of the matter is that the more physical your labor, a year or two or three more is actually challenging to the physical body. You and I might have a different perspective, but for those farmers, they're working night Thank and day. You. Thank you, Senator. I appreciate it. Governor DeSantis, finally to you, would you be open to raising the retirement age, and how would you keep Social Security sustainable? Well, look, as governor of Florida, uh, I know a few people on Social Security, and um, I know it's important. <laughs> My grandmother lived till 91, and Social Security was her sole source of income. And that's true for a lot of seniors throughout this country. So what I'd say to seniors at America, uh, promise made, promise kept. I understand what you're going through with the rising prices, uh, and you need that Social Security check. So we'll make sure to get that done. Uh, what can you do to help shore up Social Security? One of the things that's, that's causing problems is the inflation. We have to reduce inflation. When you have higher inflation, the seniors get a cost of living adjustment, which means the program's spending more, but it doesn't cover the increase in the actual inflation rate. We also do need to get to at least 3% growth. You're never going to be able to have uh, issues, be able to solve the budget without that. But I would note this. Congress, for decades, took money from Social Security. Social Security would have more tax revenue than it put out. They would take it, and then they'd write an IOU to Social Security. Congress has a lot of dirty hands on this. I'm going to fo force Congress to stop spending so much money. Um, and, you know, one thing we have to do when we talk about the retirement age is just something that's changed in the last four or five years. Life expectancy in the United States is declining So, Governor, in this yes country. or no, would you raise it? Would you raise the retirement when, age? When, uh, when life expectancy is declining, Declining, I don't see how you could raise it the other direction. So it's one thing to peg it on life expectancy, but we have had a significant decline in life expectancy in this country, so and that's just out. the fact. All right, Governor DeSantis, thank you. Thank you, candidates. And we will be right back after a quick break from Miami, Florida. To tonight's NBC News Republican presidential debate. Once again, here's Salem Radio's Hugh Hewitt. Thank you, Lester. When NBC News talks to voters, when I talk to voters every day, they all say that the border is a top issue. It can mean a lot of different things. It can mean two million people who crossed illegally last year. 
It can mean more than 150 arrests of people on the terror watch list. It can mean the burden on states from having migrants move into their states from the southwestern border. But I want to talk about opioids specifically and fentanyl. And I'll start with you, Senator Scott. Tens of thousands of Americans' families have suffered a death to fentanyl. Young people sometimes die taking one pill. What can you do as commander-in-chief on the first day to stop fentanyl and the waterfall of it into this country? Well, number one, we should close our southern border for $10 billion. We could close our southern border for an additional $5 billion. We could use the currently available military technology to surveil our southern border to stop fentanyl from crossing our border. I've already led on legislation that has sanctioned, would sanction the Mexican cartels. If you remember the path, the precursors come from China then they are manufactured in Mexican labs, and then the Mexican cartels bring them across our border. By sanctioning their accounts and eliminating their cash, we starve them of what they need, number one. Closing our southern border makes it nearly impossible to get in. The military-grade technology is a backup, making sure that we not only stop 70,000 deaths in the last 12 months because of fentanyl, It also allows us to deal with the human trafficking travesty that is entering in our country in the same path. If we are going to deal effectively with 100,000 overdose deaths in our country and the 70,000 that is directly linked to fentanyl, we have to deal with our ports of entry and deal with our southern border. If we do that effectively, we have started reducing the challenge from the outside, and then we have to deal with the challenge on the inside, which seems to be connected to a mental health crisis that is spreading throughout our nation. Governor Christie, uh, Senator Scott just mentioned ports of entry. Ninety percent of the fentanyl that is seized in the United States is seized at ports of entry. We don't know what's coming in across the open southern border. You've been a United States attorney. You've taken on cartels. Can it really be done quickly? What would you do as president? It can be done quickly in, in, in two ways, Hugh, on fentanyl. Um, the first way is exactly as, as you suggest, that ports of entry. Um, we have to beef up what our law enforcement has in terms of technology. I would invest in that as president. Um, we need to make sure that law enforcement has every tool at its disposal to do it. Secondly, on day one, I would sign an executive order that would send the National Guard to partner with Customs and Border Patrol, both at ports of entry and at the open ports of our border. Customs and Border Patrol agents are overwhelmed. There's 200,000 encounters a month over the last 11 months. We simply do not have the man and woman power at the border to be able to deal with it. And so dealing with both law enforcement, and and you're right, we have done this, we can do this, but we got to give them the tools to do it, and technology is one of the biggest tools that we don't have enough of at the ports of entry. Now, we also need to lower demand, Hugh, in this country. And the way to lower demand is to start treating people again. You know, we started to do this before COVID, and we haven't done enough of it. And for every family out there tonight who has lost a loved one to fentanyl or to any other type of opioid overdose, what you know is all you want is a chance for them to win their lives back. When I'm president of the United States, we're going to call this what it is. It is a disease, like heart disease, diabetes, or any other disease like cancer that can be treated, should be treated. We not only have to stop supply, but we have to lower demand and save lives. Governor Governor DeSantis, you have talked about using United States Special Forces to attack the cartels where they manufacture the chemicals that come from China. How often, how many, what what does that look like? Well, first, I uh, was speaking to a dad who uh, lost a son to fentanyl overdose. Son wasn't a drug addict. He had taken some pill that happened to be laced with fentanyl, and it was a fatal overdose. And when he told me, obviously the pain of losing a child is as bad as it gets, but he said what was salt in the wounds is that these elites in D.C. don't give a damn about what's going on in this country. They don't care that we have tens of thousands of opioid deaths, that the fentanyl's pouring in. They are not taking the type of action we need to. We're declaring it a national emergency on day one. I'm sending U.S. military to the border. I'm going to stop the invasion cold. I am going to deport people who came illegally. And I'm even going to build the border wall and have Mexico pay for it, like Donald Trump promised. How are you going to do it? Yeah, Mexico's not going to fork over money. We're going to impose fees on the remittance 
bonuses that foreign workers send to foreign countries. We'll raise billions of dollars, I'll build a wall. But we are going to designate the cartels to be foreign terrorist organizations or something similar to that. And we're going to authorize the use of deadly force. We're going to have maritime operations to interdict precursor chemicals going into Mexico. But I'll tell you this, if someone in the drug cartels is sneaking fentanyl across the border when I'm president, that's going to be the last thing they do. We're going to shoot them stone cold dead. Ambassador Haley. If, Ambassador Haley, if the United States uses special forces in Mexico without prior notice to the Mexican allies to our south, what would your colleagues at the United Nations think about that? I don't care what my colleagues at the United Nations think. What I'll tell you is, first of all, you have to go to the source. We have lost more Americans than the Vietnam, Afghan, Afghanistan, and Iraq wars combined. We lost 75,000 Americans last year. Go to the source. It is the reason why we'll continue to say we will end all normal trade relations with China until they stop murdering Americans. You watch how quick that flow stops. The second thing is we'll send special operations in to take out the cartels. We need to go to where they're distributing it, where the supply centers are, and take them out. We'll put 20 5,000 more Border Patrol and ICE agents on the ground and let them do their job. We will defund sanctuary cities. We will go back to the Remain in Mexico policy so that everybody stays in Mexico and they never get here in the first place. And instead of catch and deport, we'll go to catch and release. I'm sorry, instead of catch and release, we'll go to catch and deport. That is the way we'll deal with the border. Those are the things that we have to do going forward. But I do agree with Chris. One of the first things that we have to do is really focus on mental health and addiction centers. It is something that is needed in our country terribly because we don't deal with mental health and someone who doesn't get care for mental health falls into addiction and we owe it to them to treat it like the cancer that it is. Mr. Ramaswamy. Special forces in Mexico shoot them stone cold dead at the border. One thing I just want to say in how we're talking about this issue is, you know, like Ron, I've actually met many parents across this country who have lost their kids to laced pharmaceuticals that have fentanyl in them. The right. only thing I would ask, Ron, I think you'd be on the same page with me on this. Let's not even call that an overdose. Right. That is not an overdose. That is poisoning. If you put that fentanyl in a Big Mac, we would not call that an overdose. You'd call it what it is. It's closer to bioterrorism. And I say that because as it re uniquely relates to this crisis, that does warrant more aggressive means to deal with it. So there's a new presidential election in Mexico in 2024. People may not be aware of that. It's going to be someone other than Obrador, who has been a disaster in Mexico. I think he's even mentioned me obliquely in speeches to say that somebody who would do this shouldn't get anywhere near the White House. Well, AMLO, get out of the way. There's going to be someone else in charge. I hope to build a good relationship with that next president of Mexico. We'll use our own military to seal our own southern border. What we need to do is stop using our military to protect somebody else's border halfway around the world when we're short right here at home. Get serious about protecting this border. And then the other thing that hasn't been discussed is the northern border. I'm the only candidate on the stage, as far as I'm aware, who has actually visited the northern border. There was enough fentanyl that was captured just on the northern border last year to kill Three million Americans. So we got to just skate to where the puck is going, not just where the puck is. Don't just build the wall, build both walls. Can't just complete the wall, use the military to seal the Swiss cheese for the tunnels that they're actually building underneath that wall. Thank you, That's Mr. Ramos. practical and actually get this job done. Thank you. Kristen. Thank you, Hugh. Let's talk now about last night's election results. Abortion rights supporters saw victories in Ohio and Virginia following earlier wins in states like Kansas and Kentucky. Governor DeSantis, first to you, how do you see the path forward for Republicans on this issue? Well, I stand for a culture of life, and uh, I understand that it's important that everyone gets a shot. I I'm reminded of a story about a, a young mother who was struggling in Jamaica about 40 years ago, 45 years ago. She was counseled to, to not have a baby because she was poor, baby wouldn't have opportunity, and she came close to have an abortion, but she decided to have the baby born poor in Jamaica. And the reason I know that story is because that baby girl ended up emigrating to the state of Florida, uh, becoming a lawyer and a judge, and I appointed her to the Florida Supreme Court in August of 2022. 
We're better off when everybody counts. Uh, we're better off when we can promote a culture of life. At the same time, I understand that some of these states are doing it a little bit different. Texas is not going to do it the same as New Hampshire. Iowa is not necessarily going to do it the same uh, as Virginia. So you got to work from the bottom up. Uh, you got to do a better job on these referenda. I think of all the stuff that's happened to the pro-life cause, uh, they have been caught flat-footed on these referenda, and they have been losing the referenda. A lot of the people who are voting for the referenda are Republicans who would vote for Republican candidate. So you got to understand how to do that. But let's just be clear. The Democrats have taken a position. They will not identify the point at which there should be any protection all the way up until birth. That is wrong, and we cannot stand for that. All right, Governor DeSantis, thank you. Ambassador Haley, let me have you weigh in. Former President Trump has consistently blamed the abortion issue and how Republican candidates have talked about it for their electoral losses. How do you see the path forward? You know, I've said it before. I think you have to be honest with the American people. This is a personal issue for every woman and every man. I am unapologetically pro-life, not because the Republican Party tells me to be, but because my husband Michael was adopted and I had trouble having both of my children. So I'm surrounded by blessings. Having said that, when you look post row, a wrong was made right. They took it out of the hands of unelected justices and they put it in the hands of the people. And now we're seeing states vote. And what I'll tell you is, as much as I'm pro-life, I don't judge anyone for being pro-choice and I don't want them to judge me for being pro-life. So when we're looking at this, there are some states that are going more on the pro-life side. I welcome that. There are some states that are going more on the pro-choice side. I wish that wasn't the case, but the people decided. But when it comes to the federal law, which is what's being debated here, be honest. It's going to take 60 Senate votes, a majority of the House, and a president to sign it. So no, we haven't had 60 Senate votes in over 100 years. We might have 45 pro-life senators. So no Republican president can ban abortions any more than a Democrat president can ban these state laws. So let's find consensus. Let's agree on what, how we can ban late-term abortions. Let's make sure we encourage adoptions and good quality adoptions. Let's make sure we make contraception accessible. Let's make sure that none of these state laws put a woman in jail or give her the death penalty for getting an abortion. Let's focus on how to save as many babies as we can and support as many moms as we can and stop Thank the you, judgment. Ambassador. We don't need to divide America over this issue anymore. More. Thank you, Ambassador. <laughs> Senator Scott. Senator Scott, I'd like you to weigh in. Do you, how do you see the path forward? And what do you make of what Ambassador Haley just said? Do you see this as a consensus issue? Well, I'm 100% pro-life. I have had 100% pro-life voting record. I would certainly, as President of the United States, have a 15-week national limit. I would not allow states like California, Illinois, or New York to have abortion up until the day of birth. I certainly would not, not allow for governors, uh, former governor, uh, Democratic governor of Virginia, who talked about infanticide. We need a 15-week federal limit. Three out of four Americans agree with a 15-week limit. 47 out of 50 countries in Europe agree with a 15-week limit. I would challenge both Nikki and Ron to join me at a 15-week limit. It is in our nation's best interest. And frankly, I think it's unethic and unethical and immoral to allow for abortions up until the day of birth. We have an opportunity in this nation to stop that reckless behavior from states like California, New York, and Illinois. I'd go a step further. In my parents' plan, we start by talking about funding, block granting resources to crisis pregnancy centers. We should support adoption. There are a number of ways that we can say to the expectant mother that we stand with you. We should not only be pro-life before the child is born, we should be pro-life after the child is born just as much. Senator Scott, thank you. Ambassador Haley, your name was invoked. Would you support a 15-week federal limit? I would support anything that would pass because that's what would save more babies and support more moms. But do you have to be honest with the American people? And I appreciate that Tim keeps calling me out for this. But Tim, there was a bill last year. Lindsey Graham sponsored it. You didn't even co-sponsor I'm... the bill. And then when you first were interviewed on this, when you ran, you wouldn't even say you were for 15 weeks. What I am saying to the American people is, just let's true. see what we can agree on. Let's bring people together and decide what we can agree on. I will sign anything where we can get 60 Senate votes, but don't make the American people think 
that you're going to push something on them when we don't even have the votes in the Senate. It's Literally. important that we're honest about that. Let me go to Mr. Ramaswamy. Would you support a 15-week federal ban? And what is the path forward on this I, issue, I just Mr. wanted Mr. to say, I mean, Nikki Haley didn't invoke being honest. And I at least want to give credit to Tim Scott. He's honest about where he stood. And I think you should be honest, not making a political calculus, but to say, if a bill is served up, would you sign it? Here's my view on this. Speaking as a man, they say men have trouble speaking on this issue. I don't think we need to be that way. It was my home state of Ohio, I'm upset about this yesterday, that passed a constitutional amendment that now effectively codifies a right to abortion all the way up to the time of birth without parental consent. Why? It's back to that Republican culture of losing. The Republicans did not have an alternative amendment or vision on the table. I know Ohio. I was born, raised, and I lived there. It's representative of the country. If in the state of Ohio we talked about access to contraception, adoption, and also here's the missing ingredient in this movement, sexual responsibility for men. We live in an era of reliable genetic paternity tests that are 100% reliable. So we can say men deserve more responsibility. So we can tell women we're all in this together. It's not men's rights versus women's rights. It's about human rights. And I've come back to that case that Clarence Thomas spoke of. A pregnant woman walking down the street. She's assaulted. The unborn child dies in that assault. You find me one person in this country who says that that criminal does not deserve liability for that death. You won't find one. That says we share the same instincts on this issue, but we require, I believe, a different generation of leadership Rami, thank you. to actually lead us forward and unite the country on this thank with you. honesty. Thank you, Mr. Ramaswamy. Governor Christie, as you know, federal limits are important to a lot of Republicans. Where do you stand on this issue, and what is the path forward for Republicans? For 50 years, um, conservative lawyers have been arguing that the federal government should have absolutely nothing to do with this issue constitutionally because it's nowhere in the Constitution. And then Dobbs comes and we finally gain that victory, which was the creation of a constitutional right out of thin air that didn't exist. And now we have people running to say, let's short circuit the states from doing what they need to do and let's go right to some type of federal ban at a certain number of weeks. And people on the stage have been all over the place, 20 weeks, 15 weeks, 12, six. Look. The frowns were really smart. And this is an issue that should be decided in each state. And I trust the people of this country, state by state, to make the call for themselves. Now, it's going to lead to a lot of divergence. In Oklahoma, you can't get an abortion unless the life of the mother is at risk. In my home state of New Jersey, it goes up to nine months that you get an abortion. I find that morally reprehensible. But that is what the people of our state have voted for. And we should not short-circuit that process until every states people have the right to weigh in on it but here's the bigger issue kirsten the bigger issue is and tim began to touch on this we're not pro-life for the whole life to be pro-life for the whole life means that the life of a 16 year old drug addict on the floor of the county lockup is precious and we should get treatment for her to restore her life the 52 year old who's drug addicted should make sure that any of his children who he's passed that addiction on to or treated well, too. Pro-life's not just in the womb, Kirsten. It's for the whole life. All right. Governor, thank you. Candidates, thank you. We're going to take a final break. And when we come back, we'll hear from all of you with your closing statements. This is the NBC News Republican presidential debate. We'll be back right after this. Well, welcome back, everyone. With only uh, uh, two hours for a debate, we know there are other major issues that are important to Republican primary voters. I'll ask you each to please use your closing statement to focus on any topic you didn't have time to address and why you and not former President Trump would be the party's best choice to tackle these important issues. You each have a minute. Senator Scott, we'll start with you. One minute. There is a crisis that is growing in our nation, and that crisis is cultural and spiritual. We need a renewal, a great awakening. We should reject the left's valueless, faithless, fatherless society. We should turn back to faith, patriotism, and individual responsibility. 
We should stop choosing victimhood and start choosing victory. We should stop kneeling in protest and start kneeling in prayer. There are basic truths that built this country. If you're able-bodied in America, you work. If you take out a loan, you pay it back. If you commit a violent crime, you go to jail. And if God made you a man, you play sports against men. I do not just want to... Audience, please. I do not just... I do not just want to win the battle against Joe Biden. I want us together to win the war, the war for our Christian conservative Senator values Scott. that changed my life. Senator Scott, thank you. Governor Christie, Christie, you have... That's why I'm asking you remember. for your vote. Thank you for hosting tonight. Listen, it's a gift, a gift to be an American. And I'm running for president of the United States because I'm tired. I'm tired of seeing the division. I'm tired of seeing the anger. And I can see in the eyes of Americans their exhaustion, their exhaustion from the petty personal politics that have taken over this country over the last number of years. I'm running for president to be a president of consequence, to do the big things, to make sure that America's role in the world stays number one, that we stand up for our friends and allies around the world, and we stand up for what we believe in right here at home. And it's not to eliminate our differences. Our differences has always been our strength as a country, not our weakness. But you can't truly say you love America unless you're ready to open up your heart to every American. I'm going to open up my heart to every American as president, and I will make sure that I return honesty, integrity to the Oval Office. We deserve and should accept nothing less. Governor, thank you very much. Let's go to uh, Mr. Ramaswamy now. Your one minute. We've talked a lot about foreign wars tonight, but we're in the middle of a war right here at home. It's a war not between black and white or Democrat and Republican. It's between those of us who believe in our founding ideals and love this country and a fringe minority who hates the United States of America. And I think it's going to take a commander in chief to lead us to victory in that war, who first of all knows that we're in a war, second of all can't be captured by the special interests along the way. But third is from the next generation, somebody with fresh legs to lead us to victory. I'll shut down the deep state. I'll declare economic independence from China. I'll keep us out of World War III and then revive national pride in this country. I also want to close with one message to the Democrat Party. End this farce that Joe Biden is going to be your nominee. We know he's not even the president of the United States. He's a puppet for the managerial class. So have the guts to step up and be honest about who you're actually going to put up so we can have an honest debate. Biden should step aside, end his candidacy now, so we can see whether it's Newsom or Michelle Obama or whoever else. All right, Just Mr. tell us the Swami, truth so we can have an honest debate. Up. Ambassador. <laughs> Ambassador Haley, you have one minute for your closing. Thank you. The world is on fire. We have a war in Europe. We've got a war in the Middle East. We've got China on the march. It is very important that we know how to defend our freedoms and how to defeat terrorism and socialism. We have to know the difference between good and evil. We have to know the difference between right and wrong. We need to know that a strong America doesn't start wars. A strong America prevents wars. And the way we can focus on that is to make sure we go back to the soul of America and be strong and proud again. And we can't do that. We can't win the fights of the 21st century with politicians from the 20th century. We have to move forward. And we can do this. I know we can do this. So join our movement. Go to NikkiHaley.com. And we will once again show what America that's strong and proud looks like. God bless. Ambassador, thank you. <laughs> Governor DeSantis, you're closing. You have one minute. We must reverse our country's decline, and that is going to require leadership. I will take the hits, I will take the arrows, I will take the barbs, because it's not about me, it's about you. It's not about the past, it's about your future. We are going to fight for you. I am going to win for you and your family, and I'm going to lead this country's revival. As a veteran of the Iraq War and in the Navy, I will always put service above self as president. As the father of three young kids, I'm going to ensure that this country is left to the next generation in better shape than we found it. 
And as the governor of Florida, I delivered on all my promises, and you can trust me to deliver for you as the president of the United States. I am asking for your vote. Uh, I'll be a nominee that will be able to win the election. I will be a leader you can be proud of, and as your president, I will not let you down. God bless you. Governor DeSantis, thank you. That is, that is going to conclude our debate. Uh, the next line says, if the audience can hold the applause, that didn't work out. But anyway, for just a few more seconds, I'll ask you to just hold the applause. On behalf of my fellow moderators, I want to thank the candidates for their time and for this spirited debate. Really good, deep conversation, and we appreciate you all being here. Thank you as well to our wonderful hosts here at the Adrian Arsh Performing Arts Center. On behalf of the Republican National Committee and all of us at NBC News, good night, everyone from Miami.